He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen.
you know, her daughter remains and what all she had done. But to track her down, they had to go to a trailer park where Miss Adams was living and she was nearly bankrupt. Well, she really didn't have two pennies rubbed together, actually. <coughs> See, she said, I had it all and I wish I could have learned a few life lessons. The first was, I wish I could have learned the most difficult of English words, which was the word no. She said, I had relatives and friends come out of the work, everybody asked for money, and I just, you know, I just gave it away. And I invested in bad businesses and I, I lost everything. The other life lesson that she wishes she could have learned was this little one about gambling. Her money was gone in just a few years. What she didn't give away, she gambled away. And it wasn't until it was gone that she realized, yeah, I might have a little bit of a problem. To gamble away $5.4 million, not by making any big bet, but just bit by bit by bit, constantly. Oh yeah, that's more than a little bit of a problem. So many times, I think, we've seen that Powerball jackpot go up and say, oh man, if only I had that, I'd solve all my problems. I think it just gives us a new set of problems, doesn't it? But if you weren't here last week, I just let you know that Solomon was the most wealthiest man who had ever lived. His life is recounted in 1 Kings 1 to 11, and also in 2 Chronicles as well. But in talking about Solomon, you know, realize this dude was not only wealthy, I mean, he was stupid rich. Stupid rich. When the Queen of Sheba visits him, and when Hiram is also in his dealings with him, they give him, the Bible says, 120 talents of gold, which means four and a half tons of gold. Even going down to the pawn shop, the pawn shop prices, that's a chunk of change, isn't it? But that's just his gifts. His yearly tribute was five times that amount. That's stupid rich. Can't even imagine that. So it came about, as we said last week when we looked at 1 Kings chapter 3, that God had appeared to him and said, For the sake of your father, you ask anything, and I'll give it to you. And Solomon said, I would like wisdom which is knowledge of what God wants and how to live that out in your life. And God said, whoa, because you asked for that and didn't ask for money or long life or, or fame, I'm going to give you all that stuff too. So Solomon had everything, everything, but he ends up, 1 Kings chapter 11, he ends up doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. He doesn't follow the Lord completely. David, his father, and God. So the question is, is to look at the fall of Solomon and ask, you know, how does it come to this? Because Solomon is blessed. He's blessed among all things, and yet still he falls a long, long way. I think one thing that's, that we should remember is that uh, the times of adversity, you know, adversity drives us to our knees, makes us cry out for God. But times of plenty, it seems to put us in the driver's seat, or so we think. And the problem is, that's when our faith is really tested, because that's when we often crash. I mean, look at Evelyn Adams, and look at Solomon. Solomon had everything. He had all these cities that he built. They're but ruins today. They were marvels at his time. The cities, the stables, the gates, everything. He builds the temple of the Lord. The wonder of the ancient world. What really got me was this picture of the wallpaper inside. I mean, it's amazing. The wealth this man had. But in reviewing his life, there's a couple things that stand out of where he starts to slip and how he starts to slip. 
And so we're going to look at those real closely and see how they relate to our lives as well. I think one of the first places, one of the most significant places, is found in 1 Kings 6. Sorry, verse 38, right at the end. It says, In the eleventh year, the month of old, the eighth month, the temple was finished, and all its details according to its specifications. Solomon had spent seven years building it. Now get this, because the very next verse is very, very important, because the author puts it right next to it. However, it took Solomon 13 years to complete the construction of his palace. Solomon had seven years on God's house, over 13 on his. I think this is probably a significant picture. I want you to remember that. If you want to know Solomon's life and where he starts to go wrong, it's right here with his priorities. Have the people build a big temple for God and go, whoa, build me an even bigger palace than that. Our faith is tested in times of plenty. It's tested through our priorities. Do we put God first? We spoke a little bit about this last week. We spoke a little bit about it in the giving of time because, you know, not everybody is super rich like Solomon, but everybody does have 24 hours in the day. There are 168 hours in the week, and unfortunately, many people who call themselves Christians only tend to think of God for one hour out of that week. We spoke of that one out of 168, which is a joke. And if that's all you think about God, then don't be surprised if your faith crumbles in times of adversity. Don't be surprised if you never grow up, if you never really get to know Jesus the way He wants you to know Him. you got to give up your time to Him. It's a matter of priority. Solomon, you see that slipping. Now, the giving of service, this is where Solomon starts getting to this gentle and high thing, because you get chapters 6, 7, and 8, he throws these lavish, lavish worship, you know, worship gatherings for the Lord God. He has these wonderful prayers. In fact, in 7 Chronicles, in 2 Chronicles 7.14, there's one that you might have heard before. The Lord answers him after his prayer. And the Lord says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves in prayer and seek my face, then I will heal their land. Anybody ever heard that verse before? Yeah, it comes from Solomon in his worship services. All of that, and yet at the same time, 1 Kings 11 tells us, He's marrying all these foreign women and setting up altars to their gods. But he doesn't do it in Israel. Or he doesn't do it in Jerusalem. He actually does it on hills outside of Jerusalem. We'll get to that here in just a moment. The other thing is, his character is tested when you see that the giving of resources that he has. 1 Kings 7 51. 10, 21, and 23. I'm going to cross this. If you look at these verses and look at them back to back, it's rather curious because it says, When all the work King Solomon had done for the temple of the Lord was finished, he brought in the things that his father David had dedicated. And this is David's stuff, it's not his stuff. The silver and gold and the furnishings, and he placed them in the treasuries of the Lord's temple. Now Solomon did put things in there, but you notice he brings his dad's stuff. In there. And that's what goes in the temple treasury. However, 1 Kings 10, starting in verse 21, all King Solomon's goblets in his palace, and all the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's days. Oh wow, if it's of little value, then what's it doing in the treasury of the Lord? And Solomon, my goodness, God's given you so much, can't you give your best to Him? We're all called to give of our time, our, our efforts and resources 
unto God and to just give just a little bit of token, well, that's not what God has in mind. And I think what this shows is not just his priorities, <coughs> but it shows that also his character is getting, is taking a hit. Because at the same time, in 1 Kings 9, starts dealing with the, the man that he's worked with for 20 years, a man named King Hiram, who had provided so much, all the materials for the temple, craftsmen, everything else. And at the end of 20 years, during which Solomon built these two buildings, the temple and his royal palace, King Solomon gave 20 towns in Galilee to Hiram, the king of Tyre. Because Hiram had supplied him with all the cedar and pine and gold that he wanted. But when Hiram went from Tyre to see the town Solomon had given him, he was not pleased. What kind of towns are these that you give me, my brother? And he called them the land of Kabul, which means good for nothing. And Hiram had sent him four and a half tons of gold. The towns that he gave him are actually 20 towns out in the sticks, off the beaten path. It's even an effort for Hiram to go from his kingdom to see them. After all that time, and the simple fact that the guy gets five times what Hiram gives him, he gets that every year, then he could have been a little bit more generous. But I think Solomon's character is taking a hit. And I think we can see that in our own lives because when gratitude decreases, greed tends to increase. And it grows slowly and slowly. I think that's something to watch for in our own lives. Now, can you be thankful to God for what you have? We have been blessed beyond measure. I truly believe that we have been blessed beyond measure. We live in a land of plenty. Did anyone sitting in this room go hungry this week because there was absolutely nothing in the kitchen? Anyone? If you did, then call me because, you know, I mean, I didn't. I don't have to share. In this country, a land of plenty, we talk about diet. There are places in the world, people are starving. They would love to eat regularly every day. We've been blessed. Even now, we sit, we gather together in a church. We don't have to worry about anybody storming the place. I mean, I, I'm able to worship my God in peace. You know, another funny thing is that I have like a dozen Bibles. I mean, how many do you all have? Does anybody, does everybody here have a Bible? If you don't, I have 12. Okay, come on, take one. I don't care. We've all got Bibles. Bibles are so easy to get here in the U.S. Did you know in China, the underground church, their Bibles are so treasured, and because they are often confiscated, each person is required to memorize a page. Because if all their Bibles are taken, they want to be able to construct, uh, reconstruct the Bible from memory so that they are never without the Word of God. Well, I look at that, and that faith, and, and that commitment, and that discipline, and I am like, I'm not this big, you know. My goodness. Such love for the Word. And I am so blessed, and I don't stop and thank God all the time for it. I believe that when people like us who've had so many blessings, when we stand before the Lord God, we will be called unto account for the things that we have. If you have a Bible, do you read it? I think God will say, hey, everybody, I sent you a letter about me. Did you open it? I think that God will say, you had plenty, did you? share with anyone that had nothing? And he'll ask why not. I truly believe that we will be called under account. Finally, another thing that happens to Solomon is that he begins to turn into this Jekyll and Hyde where he compartmentalizes things. You know what the word compartmentalize means? Uh, basically, in Solomon's 
situation, and in the situation of, of many Christians, it's a, a time when, when basically you're one way in church, and you are the complete opposite outside. You are one way with one group of people, but you are completely different with others. There's an old quote that goes, uh, that goes something like this. That uh, people who profess Christ with their lips and they deny him by their lifestyle. I mean, that's what an unbelieving world finds simply unbelievable. I honestly believe that if each and every Christian lived out their walk with Christ to the fullest, people would be beating down the door saying, What do you have in that place? What is this Jesus all about? Because I want something else. I believe our lives would shine as a light and an example. But I think too often we compartmentalize things. I know that I know that old, uh, old Solomon did. It says so in Second Chronicles eight eleven, where it says Solomon brought back Pharaoh's daughter. That's from one of the nations. God said, "No, don't marry him." Brought back Pharaoh's daughter up from the city of David to the palace he had built for her. And this is why. He says, My wife must not live in the palace of David, king of Israel, because the places of the ark of the Lord are holy. Now, if she worships God Almighty, she can be there, but obviously <coughs> it's because she still worships her own gods. I mean, this is what I forget about Solomon. He's so wise. That does he not think that God won't see? So he builds a house for her somewhere else. The other idols and shrines that he built are on hills around Jerusalem, but nothing's in Jerusalem. We're going to keep that set apart for, for Yahweh, but everything else, let's, you know, hey, sky's the the limit. There you go. Inconsistency does not work in a Christian life. I think that with God, there's no such thing as compartmentalizing. There's no such thing as like Jeff on the night thing. There is only what is called open rebellion before him. Sin. And that's not a good thing. I remember those children of Israel who wandered in the desert 40 years because they rebelled. It is sin before God. And so to be one way among his people and then another way out of line. You don't get away you got to be consistent. you got to be consistent. I think that pride is the thing that makes us compartmentalize. As I say, compartmentalization is, is actually rebellion before the Lord. I think in the end, the lesson from Solomon that we get is that we are called to put God first in all things. And all things. By the time it gets to chapter 11, where Solomon is marrying all these women, that's just a symptom of the problem. The problem occurred way back before with priorities, his character, and everything else. We're called to put God first in all things, to give of ourselves to Him, and to be authentic, to be real, to be the same way that we are in church and worship before God, to be that same way outside these walls. That's what we're called to be. And when we're not that way, bad things happen. Our witness is damaged. Sin creeps into our life. And we are in danger of falling away. Just like Solomon. Just like Solomon. I just want to leave you with this. My call for you to be consistent in your life, it's not just for you, not just for you all too. It's not just something that helps you. But I know many of you here have children, have grandchildren, many of you here have friends that are very close. You will tremendous influence on people. Tremendous influence, more than you know. 
children or grandchildren, you never know when, if they're far from the Lord now, after you pass, there will come a time in life where God will use those memories and He will stir them. He will stir your children to look back to Him. Your legacy is very important. So be consistent in all things. Don't end up like Saul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you now, I ask that you will grace and peace. I ask that your grace, your power, would be upon us so that we might live lives consistent with you. Lord, that our legacy might be one that points to you and the reality of you in our lives, God. Lord, I ask that this would be passed on with our friends, family, and to the next generations, Lord, that you might use the testimony and witness to turn our loved ones to turn them back to you. So of this, in Jesus' name, in his name we pray. Amen. <coughs> you please stand together and join me. I'm closing him in number 358. Or 360, that's a good one. 368.